Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please go to the iTunes store, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and review for us. Maybe that'll inspire Apple to promote us a little more. And of course, you can always promote us by telling people about the podcast on social media or however else you publicize the things you like. You can support the Virtual Memories Show and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. You'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and... Help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. All right, I'm in better shape than last week, (coughs) except for coughing up a lung. And I uh, do actually have a lot of work stuff ahead, uh, including a conference in New York City where I got to moderate a bunch of panels, run my quarterly board meeting, uh, find time to meet with potential clients, maybe jump on a call or two for Washington stuff. But that's, that's the job. Um, The plus side is I am three weeks ahead on the podcast, which gets me back to my New Year's resolution of not going into a weekend without having next week's show either recorded or at least lined up. The next few weeks work out, I'm going to be set for most of the summer, which is kind of weird. Once I started slotting all of these potential and scheduled guests into weekly places and realized it was running up through August. So we'll see how all those work out. Now, this week's episode... um, Well, it came together in a hurry, which is probably for the best. My guest is Jaime Hernandez, who is one of the greatest cartoonists ever to put pen to paper. Now, Jaime's lifelong work has been in a comic called Love and Rockets, which he shares with his brother, Gilbert. Uh, That comic has been rolling on in one format or another since 1981, uh, and it features stories from each of the brothers. Jaime's center around his greatest creation, Maggie, and her one-time and occasional girlfriend, Hopi. Uh, We first meet them as teenage punk rockers in a Southern California barrio, but over the decades, we learn more and more of their their world, the lives around them. We see them age. Um, It's there's no way to describe how amazing love and rockets is as, as a book, not as just as comics. Uh, Jaime's, characters have a a degree of truth to them that's it's just almost peerless comics or prose it, it doesn't matter and and that's in terms of both writing and art um and the world they inhabit even when it takes some flights of fancy you know it really is ours um and it's so much more than ours now uh jaime's brother gilbert his comics achieve a an equal but really different stature um and it's just amazing that they've been able to tell their stories for almost 40 years now um basically every every new issue of love and rockets whether it's it was bi-monthly annual quarterly where i I think it is now it's a treasure uh the collections are are just a joy to read um in fact when i began the podcast way back in 2012 i put together a spreadsheet of prospective guests and there was a mount rushmore slash dream guests section uh, which includes both jaime and gilbert and um, and I had a nice conversation with Gilbert last year, and we made tentative plans to record next time we're together. But I really didn't expect that I'd end up sitting down with Jaime at any time. Um, and this all came about because Jaime has a new book out. Um, it's not a Love and Rockets book. It's called The Dragon Slayer, Folk Tales from Latin America. And it's a young reader's book published by Toon Books. That's T-O-O-N. 
Over the course of about 45 pages, Jaime adapts these three wonderful folk tales for, for young readers, The Dragon Slayer, Martina Martinez and Perez the Mouse, and Tup and the Ants. And they're just nutty uh, and, and fun, like folk tales can be. And Jaime's artwork just makes them a blast to read. A publicist at Toon Books emailed me a few days before the MoCA Festival, two weekends ago, to innocuously ask if I had any interest in sitting down with Jaime to record during his New York visit. I um, I laughed, hyperventilated, played it cool, wrote back, yeah, sure, that'd be great. Uh, can you send me a copy of the book so I can familiarize myself before we sit down? Um, then they said they'd, they'd try to confirm his availability. I pitched the backup plan of getting together in Toronto during TCAF in, in May uh, when I noticed he was going to be a, a guest there. Um, and then they confirmed our MOCA date with about 24 hours notice. Um, and it's the same day that I was scheduled to host a live podcast session with Roz Chast. Um, as it turns out, as I mentioned at the beginning, I think the lack of prep time turned out to be a good thing. I've met Jaime a couple of times over the years, and he's always been a little quiet. And I always assume it's me. And I have a feeling that if I spent a lot of time getting ready and working up like deep, intricate questions, it might not have led to a really good conversation. So instead, I sort of winged it, which I think was a better strategy. Also, I had the smart idea of inviting our mutual pal, Katie Skelly, to sit in with us while we recorded. Uh, Katie's been on the show before, and we're hoping to record a new episode soon. Uh, she was at a signing table with Jaime before our session, and it hit me that, huh, Maybe if the three of us are there, you know, it'll be a little better gestalt, you know? So hi, uh, Katie has a new book out from Fanographics right now called My Pretty Vampire. And I'm, again, hoping we can sit down and talk soon. Now, here's Katie actually talking about what Love and Rockets means to her. Tell me about the first time you read Love and Rockets. Oh, no. <laughs> how did you discover the comic? I'm not going to embarrass Jaime like that. Um, how did I discover the comic? Yeah, do you remember a just, first, uh, a first I Eleanor? don't have a first memory of it. No, it, it feels like anything else that, I mean, I'm not trying to embarrass Jaime, but it feels He's like anything listening. else that I was reading in, in high school. Like, it was just sort of like, you'd go to the comic shop and you'd go to the alternative shelf and you'd grab your Dan Klaus or you'd grab Chris Ware. And I was just trying a lot of different things and just finding love and rockets and being like, yeah, this is the one that I care about. Like, you know, yeah. that Don't worry, he's that not I listening. Okay. <laughs> it's stressful with I may being right I'm there. I'm 58 years old, so I'm deaf. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, to be like completely honest, I don't feel like I loved it as much as I do now, now that I know Jaime, like now that I understand Jaime, I think as a person, it just takes on a completely different context. And I think more than, I mean, I love the story so much, but more than anything, I love how human the characters are. And that's so rare. You just don't see it in comics. You don't see it at all. And that, that sort of range of expression and like emotional intelligence and, it doesn't exist. So Love and Rockets is my go-to when I want to like feel something when I read a comic. I read a lot of like very cold comics. I like my like cold, you know, Euro sleaze, like sex exploitation stuff. Yeah. But then, you know, when I'm like, okay, I'm ready to be a person again, <laughs> that's when I can go to the shelf and grab literally anything. Like any Love and Rockets is going to be the one. Awesome. See? Thanks, Katie. Yeah, thank you. I hope that gives you a little more of an idea about what Jaime and his brother Gilbert have accomplished over nearly 40 years of producing Love and Rockets. I was delighted to see that Jaime has this young reader book out from Toon, and if I had kids, this is exactly the sort of thing that I'd be giving them in hopes of building a new generation of, of comics aficionados and, and, you know, weirdos, I guess. And I really appreciate the Toon Books publicity staff for reaching out like this, following up, and, and just making this episode happen. Now here's Jaime's incredibly scant bio from his publisher, Fantagraphics. Jaime Hernandez lives in Pasadena, California with his wife and daughter. He is co-creator of the long-running, award-winning, and critically acclaimed series, Love and Rockets. His new book is The Dragon Slayer, Folk Tales from Latin America. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Jaime Hernandez. Mm -hmm. 
So tell me about the book. We have the Dragon Slayer, Folk Tales from Latin America. What was, what was the origin for the, the new book? Um, um, uh, it, Who pitched it? How did it begin? Uh, You've always done your own projects, and this is something for another publisher. So. Francois uh, approached me to do a book. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, there wasn't any plan of what the book would be about, but she wanted me to do one for Tune Graphics. And I said, well, okay, I'll consider this. And I didn't think about it for a year or two. <laughs> yeah. And then I, I had some room, I, I felt, f- to do some extra work. And I thought, sure, I'll do a kid book for her. How hard could that be? You know? And I, and I, uh, so I, I saw her at a show, or I, I can't remember. And I said, hey, I, I'm ready to do a book, whatever. She goes, great. And then for the next month or so, I was getting emails and from her giving me ideas. And I was going, well, good. I don't have to think of <laughs> anything. And uh, and uh, she started me sending me all these sources of, uh, from, of old folk tales from uh, all over. But I, was, I picked ones from Mexico because I figured if there was any... Cl- country i knew i would yeah. know that more even if i don't <laughs> yeah you can pretend yeah. yeah yeah and uh and then so uh we started picking out stories or i i started going well i like this one i like i think i i picked the dragon slayer i liked it because you know it was a, a princess story but where the princess has to do everything mm-hmm. which i thought well that's that's kind of like my characters, my characters have no superpowers, but they yet they have to fix problems, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then she started to send me different ones like, well, what do you think about this one? And, and then we'd go back and forth and then I would go, well, I want to do about the one about the man uh, whose wife dies and he buries her and then he dies and he gets buried in with her and then the rest of the story is about them uh, in this coffin together talking to each other mm-hmm. dead you know and yet and then a little mouse family builds a little home in their coffin and it's just, i just thought it was just really cool and wacky but we didn't end up doing that one um i could see it being less of a kid's folktale in that respect yeah i could, yeah, i don't know I, I yeah um i'm trying to think back some of the stuff's not so clear, but um, but anyway, we ended up uh, uh, picking these three, and and uh, yeah, it was just it was just kind of back and forth. Um, mm-hmm. I kind of I kind of let her put a lot of input in it because I was I was really like like I kind of don't want to overthink this one. That's just one. Did did you like that idea of having? I don't want to say just being the artist, but you know having someone else guiding the the project in that way yeah yeah i i, I actually welcomed it because yeah. i part of me was lazy i didn't want to go and research anything <laughs> yeah. I, I was like i just want to draw my dumb comics and do it you know and do it as as fun as i i can and uh so i was kind of happy that she was very involved and kind of like what do you think about this so I didn't have to go search out that story. Um, it came to me, yeah. you know, and all I had to say was yes or no or or whatever. So, did you start drawing any other ones that you felt eh, actually this isn't working? We'll try a different one, or was it pretty much once you settled on the stories themselves, they were the ones that? Oh, uh, when when together? we settled on the stories, I was like, okay, I'm committed to, to Those finishing three. this one, you know. And then, but some of them, like, uh, I I I can admit it now, but. <laughs> Like, like there's the scene where the mouse uh, climbs up the stove to to get the golden onion and mm-hmm. the soup, and then he falls in. Right after I drew that, I thought, oh, that's clever. I get to put my own little spin on it. Um, I saw that John Stanley book that Fanographics put out, mm-hmm. and it had, <laughs> it had a, a page done by an artist that Stanley that Stanley wrote, I don't know who the artist was, who drew these mice climbing up a stove. Yeah. And I just go, that's way better than, <laughs> Son of a- than what I drew. <laughs> anyway, and so I started to have doubts like, 
is my stuff, am I too lazy about this? Should I have, should I have uh, researched this more and stuff? And then I realized, no, I put in what I put in and it organically falls into place. Mm -hmm. It's not like every time I think, should I have overdone this more? Should I have yeah. added more? It never works. So this is how it would have ended up anyway, right. even if I busted my ass 20 more times mm -hmm. than uh, I did. Was the drawing process different for you? No, I was, you know, I think of kids. I, yeah. I naturally go into this uh, mm -hmm. this style. Um, I mean, you had those young Ray stories and all that, which yeah. I hate the fact that that's now probably 20 years ago, but it seems like it was just a right. few issues back. <laughs> yeah, and I yeah. and and before this, I did those first, second uh, fairy tales, sure. uh, fables, and... Uh, and uh, uh, nursery rhymes. I did those, which were kind of done the same way. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like, well, let's do it this way. I I, I like uh, I like getting cartoony when it comes to kids because the drawings are more alive. They just more or they bust out more. They yeah. they they create a life of their own that. Uh, if if it was drawn more seriously, it seems like the kids would have to study it more to see what's going on. This way, it's just like in their face, bam. Yeah. Did you have folk tales like this when you were a kid growing I up, or did never... comics really replace folk tales? Because that's what it was like for me, and I, you're a little bit older than I am. So. Well, when I read these folk tales, as much as I loved them, I had never heard of any of them. Yeah. I had never, and. And while I thought, God, these are wacky, I love this. You know, where where have these been my whole life? But um, my folk tales went from uh, stories by elders, you know, of my family, my grandmother and, and mm -hmm. my aunts and my mom telling us stories about growing up, you know, having a neighborhood ghost when they grew up, you know, that kind of thing. Those were yeah. my, that was my folk. We had gypsy, gypsies down the hill who my parents had adopted me from, and they told me they kept the receipt so they could always bring me back if I was bad. That was uh, my father was Romanian, so we actually believed this because of the gypsy thing. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so so I heard I heard our own family folk tales that mm -hmm. only revolved around our family. Someone outside would not know these stories, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, it's kind of the same thing. It's just not told. Um, like a fairy tale like these were. Yeah. You know? Um, that's a, a weird way to phrase this or a weird question I ask, but the work you and your brother have done on love and rockets all these years sort of, I don't want to say defines a Mexican American slash Latin American experience in comics for people, but it kind of does. Um, did that, inform what you were doing here in terms of the, hey, we're kind of responsible for the way, you know, Mexican-Americans are for, largely portrayed in comics, or were the guys who've done that primarily for decades now, do that play into the, you know, again, the decision, like you said, to, to work in this? Uh, maybe this not moment? on my end, maybe on the, yeah. in the editorial sense, but, um, but for me, I always knew when we started doing this comic, that the more I did my culture, you know, my Southern California, Mexican culture, um, the more I started to get removed from other people's stories. Like I only told the stories I knew yeah. of what my, my little clique, my little uh, neighborhood did, my, my town of Oxnard, how we were. It was different in other cities because, you know, everyone's got their own story to tell. Um, maybe the fashion overlapped and stuff like that, but I knew that that if every anyone comes to me and says that this isn't how it was, I'll go. Well, it was. Come to my come to my town and tell yeah. me that this isn't what uh, mm -hmm. what was going on. Um, but I knew that I was telling my own story. I always I never went into it kind of trying to represent my uh, yeah the being whole, the a whole, stand in for the entire yeah people yeah, because. Uh, you know, what I called the way I ate tortillas and beans was different from somebody else. Yeah. You know. At what point did you get that, like, the experiences and the stories you were telling were really reverberating? 
Uh, in that way that people were really in this book no in in, oh, in your your throughout your career wait, the I guess. question again i'm sorry um the stories as you started with love and rockets um at what point did you guys or did you particularly get that the stories you were telling were really hitting with an audience especially an audience that wasn't necessarily comics fans right. was there a a time where that that hit you that holy shit people are actually reading into this and this isn't just the post seventies superhero crowd. That's uh... right. Um, yeah, I guess I, I guess it was pretty early when people were telling me how they liked how we handled characters, and mm -hmm. and women were telling me they liked the way I did women. And I didn't know if I was doing women right, you know. Yeah. I, I, but um, so it was pretty early on that like. Okay, they like and they can relate what I'm doing. Now they're mine. And I yeah. and you know, you guys are mine. I'm going to take you into my world now and this is how things things are are done. Um you know, I never I've never uh tried to write down to my my fans or tried to uh, like you're going to take this or or else kind yeah. of thing, but at the same time um uh, if you're willing to accept these particular things in my comic, then hop aboard. We're on for a long ride. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but we're closing in on 40 years. So it, it does seem to be working <laughs> pretty well. It was another, just like yesterday thing. I remember seeing you and your brother on a panel for the 30th anniversary and then realized that was six years ago or seven years ago. And we're, we're kind of, yeah, Zowie. Um, what were the comics growing up for you? What were you reading when you were a kid? Um, I assume Hank Ketchum and things like that. Well, but... this was the early sixties. So then there was, it was a broader, uh, it was a lot broader than the seventies and eighties, um, before Mar the Marvel way took over things. Mm -hmm. Um, so I grew up on Marvel comics, DC comics, uh, Dennis the Menace comics, uh, Archie comics, uh, Harvey comics, which were Richie Rich, Little Dot, yeah. and stuff like that. Um, just whatever was out there, you know, and and accepting that all of it belonged, you know. Mm -hmm. There was not, uh, there was not, there was no genre of comics that was better than the others. Of course, I went through my Marvel Kirby stage. I went through my, you know, I, I, uh, went through things like that, but I still went back to uh, Betty and Veronica comic. I still went back to uh, Dennis the Menace. I, you know, I, it, it all, like I said, it all belonged. And where'd the storytelling impulse start? At what point were you, were you the kid drawing comics the whole time or did you kind of... <laughs> I was drawing... I was drawing comics because my brothers were. You yeah. Know, Mario. I'm envisioning the crumb thing where Charles is press ganging the kids into drawing. Sure. But, yeah. Mario was drawing comics, but he was like six and a half years older than me. So he always was the big kid. Uh, Gilbert was always more like, Hi, let's draw, let's draw, you know. And, uh, and then we had, and then my other brother, Richard, was, there were three of them uh, older than me. And, and everybody drew. And then my younger brother and my sister, they, every, everybody drew at one time. So whatever Gilbert and Mario did, they always seemed, it always seemed like they knew what they wanted to do. You know, they were always, whatever they were drawing, I thought, these guys are serious. And I had no clue how to tell a story. I would start it off with, you know, Batman character going, bandits. Let's get them. And then pow, zam, pow, bam, blah, blah. And then the cops coming and saying, take them away. You know, that's how my comics ended. If I finished a comic. Yeah. And, um, but Gilbert, Gilbert was just amazing. He just had concepts constantly. Like he would start a series of, uh, a comic about these explorers underground, uh, exploring, you know, weird worlds and stuff. And then, but he would, he would draw issue after issue and he would continue it and he would end, he would start it and he would end it. I couldn't do that. 
I could not, I could not, I could barely finish anything because I just had no concept of telling a story. It wasn't, it wasn't till I was uh, in my teens after high school and I just started going back going, uh, like, what was it that I liked about these? Why do I keep going back to these Archie comics with these particular artists? And why do I keep going back to these Dennis the Menace comics? I kept going back and I kept going, oh, I like this. I like this because cause look at Archie and Jughead are just walking down the street and they're not doing anything super. super. Yeah. They're not. They're just walking down the street complaining about whatever's going on in their lives. Little things like that. And, and, uh, Dennis the Menace is, is, uh, you know, he wants to go to the North Pole. He wants to go to the North Pole, but his mom is explaining to him what the North Pole is really like because Dennis just wants to go see Santa. And it's this whole page. I go, I tell this story a lot. Sorry. Um, where this whole page where she's just giving him a bath and then putting his pajamas on and sending him to bed while she's telling him what the North Pole is like. Mm-hmm. And I just remember going, I don't, I've never seen this anywhere else. I've never seen where it's just a, a comic book about a mom putting their kid to bed. Mom could put me to, me to bed the same way, you know, when I was a kid, yeah. you know. Uh, and I just started to enjoy the things that, affected me and I started to pinpoint like this is why I like these comics I like these characters I want to create characters that do this because it's just so personal to me and this is not what I'm supposed to be drawing but this is what I I want to draw Mm -hmm. and so you know I'd go oh yeah and then and then that one where little Archie is walking down the walking down a country road and he's just thinking to himself while, and you see a barn, you see a barn far away with a shaded side and you know that the sun's going down. And I just remember going weather, weather is like, uh, is important to the feel, to feel of, of, uh, the feeling of what these people are going through. You know, it's like, you know, an artist would draw someone and then a leaf blowing by. Yeah. And I go, I know where they are. I know how, what time of day it is. I know. And I, it just really became really important to me. Like, okay, so it's, it's the weather. Maggie and Hopi walking down the street. If the background is blank, it's because it's a sunny day and it's all sky. You know, I'm from yeah. Southern California where it's all sky, you know, and I just thought that's the way that's the way I want my characters to feel. I want them to feel how I feel, you know, and I'm going to do my damnedest to make the reader feel exactly the way I felt. And that's what became important to me. I don't think this has any to, anything to do with your question, <laughs> okay. but this is where it led me. <laughs> <laughs> Had you thought about, well, had art school been a, a potential thing when you were growing up? I remember taking uh, like cartooning classes, like in junior college, mm-hmm. and uh, expecting something out of it. But yeah. I knew there wasn't anything for me. Mm-hmm. I had heard that there were comic schools in the country, like the Kubert School, and and uh, but I was from Oxnard. We had no money. I didn't know that you that people actually spent money to go to the <laughs> these <Yeah>. schools. <laughs> it was kind of like, well, they have schools for comics. Wow. That must be pretty cool. Yep. Guess All we'll right. get back to drawing. What do we do? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. yeah. So, um, and then the classes I took, like, you know, I remember on career day in high school, you know, you, they take the class out and there's like tables around with pamphlets and stuff like that. And they go, you, so I want you to pick out a pamphlet to what you, what you think you want to do with your life. And I just remember going, you're not going to have anything for me. And so I would go and I'd get the commercial art thing. 
And I'd go, I don't know what they do in commercial art. I, you know, I was like, it was kind of like, like school ain't, school's not going to do it for me, you yeah. know? And hopefully I, I'm going to do, draw my own comics and someone will find them someday. You know, I was pretty naive about it, you know, just like, Maybe one day someone will go, hey, we like this, you know, and they'll go, hey, 10 more people should buy this, you know, but, but yeah, I, I didn't really look like this was going to be my big career. Yeah. yeah. There was never a thought of, you know, I'll do this and then I'll move up to the big leagues of Marvel, et cetera. No, no. Cause by yeah. the time that Gilbert and I wanted, uh, wanted to do comics whether small or whatever on a small scale we didn't want to do marvel yeah. we didn't want to do any of that stuff we wanted to do our own thing mm -hmm. and part of that was uh i remember when uh heavy metal magazine came out in 77 came out when i was sounds right i was 76 uh, yeah. 77 because i remember i wasn't 18 yet i yeah. couldn't buy it but gilbert and mario could yeah. but um <laughs> I remember just looking at it and seeing all these like uh, French artists and Italian artists and uh, European artists like just doing comics about had nothing to do with superheroes. Yeah. And just thinking like, uh, you know, part of me going like, yeah, you don't, it doesn't have to be about anything. It could be about anything you want. And then, th and then that helped me think back like, yeah, we used to read comics that had nothing to do with this this yeah this Marvel world. You see, for me, it was uh, late '90s. I interviewed a bunch of Israeli cartoonists, Rutu Modan, and a bunch of the other people in that little mm -hmm. uh, collective she was in. And that was I was mid twenties at that point. It was really my first moment of when I asked them about the comics they read as kids, realizing that you can grow up with comics with no superheroes whatsoever in your entire culture. And that's, that was their thing. Like, yeah, we read comics growing up, but there were no superheroes and we never bothered drawing those things. And you realize culturally, you know, if you come from a certain framework, it'll influence the sort of stuff you write or mm -hmm. the sort of stuff you draw. So. Right. There's a, Gilbert reminded me a story where, uh, at one of the first SPX shows might've been the first one that Frank Miller went. Yes, I, you know, I was, was at that one too. Yeah. <laughs> so he went and Gilbert remembers Frank Miller looking around going, none of these people want to work for Marvel. That was, that was a speech he gave at the Ignatz Awards where he said he, he came in thinking everyone was going to be a farm system, that they were all that he walked around and picked up everybody's work and he realized you, you have no interest in drawing Daredevil and Batman. This isn't a thing for you. Yeah. You actually want to tell your own stories. And he, until 1998, I guess, he had no, gra no you know, uh, thought of that because he was working in that yeah. mainstream system. Yeah. So, have, you, uh, have you met Miller? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I met him when I first broke in, actually. Yeah. Yeah, what was your experience? Uh, how were you guys treated by mainstream guys when you were... That was our first support because there yeah. was no alternative uh, right. fan base. I mean, they were, they just were not living all in yeah. the city. <laughs> 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 you know, um, so in the beginning, we were supported by uh, the mainstream. Mm -hmm. But I think most of them thought this was our stepping stone yeah. to... Uh, that you would eventually get to drawing Wonder Woman because yeah. you like yeah, girls. Get our, I remember people telling me uh, that which will remain nameless, that, like you know, you got you know you got to do this so you can get your foot in the door. And then that's when I fold my arms, and go, what, what door <laughs> are you talking about? Well, I remember it was just starting college, so late eighties. I remember reading a Alan Moore interview in the Comics Journal where he was. Again, going on about how if they had any brains, they would be hiring you for Wonder Woman and, and Dan Klaus for a Jimmy Olsen book and all that. And even then I thought, yeah, but that implies that those guys want to do this instead of, at yeah. the time, Lloyd Llewellyn and then 8-Ball and yeah. you having your own, uh, your own body of work. Um, what are you better at? In terms of is it the the drawing, the storytelling, et cetera. Oh, oh, and what do you I thought you were gonna talk about other things. Well, yeah, there's that too. <laughs> but not with a woman in the room. We do have a woman in the room, by the way. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and that's why we have Katie here for gosh sakes. <laughs> Just to, to keep us straight. Um, what am I? What am I? Yeah, what um, are you better at? And what are you worse at? What's tougher for you to do now? In and the what's beginning, easier? I, I had. I wasn't a good writer. I didn't know how to write from beginning to end. It took it took a while yeah. to get to get a whole story together. It would take me a long time. Um, so I guess I was I used to be worse at writing. Now it all kind of melds together. I don't know which is the strongest part of my work. Mm -hmm. You know, I I try to do the I try to do it all good, but uh, they stop saying. Gilbert's the writer, Heim is the artist. They used yeah. to say that. Yeah, you know, yeah, I recall. Yeah. And that was always a schism, uh, whether you liked your brother's work or yours, when we were, you know, fans in my, yeah. my 20s and stuff. It was, well, I'm more of a Palomar guy. And, and yeah. Right. Um, how, I, I, I'm sure this is an evolutionary process for you, so it'd be tough to break out, but how did you get better, I guess, in terms of knowing what to leave out? Because your stories, I don't want to say they're sparse, but you've, you managed to get things down to essentials so well that right. you don't have all this extraneous uh, stuff. You managed to tell a story efficiently. Do you remember either influences that helped you along that path or was it just uh, Gilbert the... was a big influence. Yeah. Yeah. Especially Gilbert, um, because, uh, since we are sharing the book, we never really competed, but at the same time, it was kind of like only the tough survive in this comic. So if you're not, if you're not on your toes, then that other person's going to dust you kind of thing. And I remember when the, uh, Gilbert just started blasting out these stories mm -hmm. left and right and complete stories beginning middle and endings and I just remember going God Maggie and Hopi are going to the supermarket that's all I've got <laughs> that's, I swear you know and, yeah. and and I but I didn't know at the time I was just building character I was just like all I cared about was these their characters and the story was not important and but seeing how Gilbert had this kind of focus on telling these small like graphic novels in one issue yeah you know i was i was and he was getting a really good response from him i was kind of like well maybe i should start taking storytelling more seriously you know because he's he's so good at it yeah. <laughs> you know and he's just going gangbusters and i just feel like i'm just like like what just, do i do now what yeah do just I do probing now? around the Which, world but but in the in hindsight i don't I don't uh, regret it because I was building character, and that's and uh, people loved Maggie and Hopi, and it was just because I was just putting these two characters on pay on the on the page. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, it was almost like the story didn't was them, yeah. Instead of a story with them in it, mm -hmm. you know. And then you kind of shifted gears along those lines. I started to. I remember uh, I did. Uh, I did the return of Ray D in in number twenty, and I remember going, "Hey, I got a complete story here. I I got it. You know, I can understand how this works now." And I remember going, "I did it. I I made a successful single single story, and I was really happy with that." And Death of Speedy came shortly after that. And so I had, that was when I found it. Yeah. I like, hey, okay, I can do this. And I can still build character at the same time, you know. And so that was, that was when that happened. And, uh, see, my problem was I, I picked up a couple of the early, like the, the smaller sized collections from Fanta, but the first real issue I bought of yours was, um, Flies on the Ceiling with, with Izzy and, possibly your most fragmented and and weirdly told story and and that was my entry point for your stuff and i was like that is not what i thought this comic was gonna be <laughs> <laughs> which which one again the one uh in number 29 the one with the uh the, oh, the chicken oh, okay cover. okay yeah yeah and that was just uh it's like wow okay i guess i gotta go back and figure out what the hell's going on here and yeah it turned out to be an anomaly as far as your your storytelling went but uh 
although I did tell the um, the story in last week's episode of the show that um, this all started when I got to college and had one dude who was a drummer from Texas who knew I was a comics guy I said, dude, don't read those superhero comics anymore. You got to read this book from California and, and handed me my first Love and Rockets and that kind of, <laughs> yeah, I had the never look back really moment, but, um, but you stayed in tune with the whole superhero thing. Me? You. I mean, you still love the, the stuff in the, the 70s into the, the 80s? Well, you, uh... um, I was, you know, I I was still a teenager when I, when, yeah. you know, the new X-Men came out and right. stuff. But after a while, I was buying comics out of habit. Like, I was into the Legion of Superheroes, but... You just had to keep buying it. And even I kept though... buying it, waiting for it to be drawn well. You know, that, that was the same thing. I felt like Keith Giffen broke his hand and started drawing with his other hand at one point. And, and... anyway, sorry. <laughs> this might have been before. Well, maybe that's... I ran that, ran the 300s, but... Yeah. Yeah, this is our but, slight nerding out thing. Don't, don't worry. But, it. but, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and, and so by the time um, our, we started our own comic, this stuff started to drop off. Like, I was buying the new Teen Titans, but after a while going, why am I still buying this? Yeah. You know, I, I just still wasn't interested anymore. I get you. Now, how do characters change for you? Especially when you're introducing characters who you may consider just to be incidental and end up discovering that they actually have a life of their own and, and become significant players in your your story. Do you feel that at all when you're you're writing or drawing that, you know, I actually kinda like drawing this guy, let's figure out, you know, more sure, of his life. Sure. Or, yeah. Like um some some characters come to life by just um gestures. You mm -hmm. know, and I kind of like, hey, I'm enjoying this. I, they could be a great uh, cog in the wheel, you know, for this for this group of people. You know, mm -hmm. I, I could, uh, you know, I don't know, just they. I just I I learned to like them. Yeah. Kind of like I know. Like I'm asking something. It's a variant of where do you get your ideas? And I know it's the most bullshit question to possibly ask. So you feel free to not. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's that's all I wonder because it, it's such a it's a sprawling cast without being a soap opera. You know, you manage to to grow these things, but actually, you know, invest the characters with feeling as opposed to just plot mechanisms. You know, they're not just there to advance an action or something. You, right. You know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was just wondering how that um, if you felt that occurring in the process of of doing these things sometimes. Yeah, you know, it's like liking doing some characters more than others, you know, yeah. the, the ones, the, the characters that either figure out their problem or I can't figure out a problem with them usually fall to the side and I never do them again, or they don't come back for like five years because they've either figured it out or they've, uh, or they have no, nothing to figure out, you know? And, yeah. and I like the ones that are puzzled that are, that are never complacent that, that, that have some kind of angst, you know, because mm -hmm. they're searching, you know, they're, they're constantly searching for the outcome, you know, and when the outcome happens, the story's done. Yeah. You know? Now about the decision to extend the characters in time, as opposed to, you know, always telling stories of young Maggie and Hopi and, and really kind of bringing them into middle age and, and beyond. What prompted it? Did you um, feel your own sense of the, huh, I'm not tired of writing about people from before my time? I, I remember uh, Gilbert talking about that he liked the Gasoline Alley uh, characters yeah. aged. And I was thinking, yeah, that's good. I think that's when I started too. I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. And then... Uh, not that long ago, I was looking at old uh, uh, pre Love and Rockets sketches of Maggie building Maggie's character, you know, cutting her hair or or whatever, you know. And I remember I had a little chart of Maggie's age, and <laughs> I remember since I was what my late teens, she went up to age thirty four and then disappeared. <laughs> Yeah. From people's lives because I didn't know what you couldn't imagine what somebody <laughs> <laughs> and but but so I look back and that was pre before uh the gastronomy in Ellie thing. So 
I'm just trying to figure out where it came from because I've got evidence that we were thinking about it before, mm-hmm. before that. Do you feel like a grown up? Hmm? Do you feel like a grown up? Sometimes. Yourself? Okay. Never can tell. Never sure with artists in particular uh, if it's a feeling that you're getting away with something. No, I, or... Katie and I were talking about this earlier, um, yeah. that yeah. I really liked when I became a grown-up. Why is that? Because I found out how stupid grown-ups are and how petty <laughs> adulthood is. And yeah. I just remember going, you mean this is what you guys worried about this whole time? Yeah. And I just remember going, it's easy, man. Just it's an extension easy. of high school and... and... What's that? Is it an extension of high school, basically? Well, for them it is. Yeah. I I couldn't wait to get out of that mm-hmm. that uh, high school kind of mentality, uh, you know. But then I have plenty of friends who could say I never grew up, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the way I look at it, it's it it just uh, you, you just stop you just stop worrying about certain bullshit. Because adulthood's going to take over with new bullshit you got to deal with, you mm-hmm. know. So stop worrying about what you worried about in high school. Yeah. You know, I don't know. It just. I get you. But the um, the recent Maggie and Hopi comics you've done have sort of centered around a reunion of characters from from those years. Anything prompted that, or was it you know um, anything in real life? prompt that sort of thing or is it just the again looking back at a certain age and thinking about um yeah and what helps is is um i met my wife when she was a young punk rocker before we ever got together we were friends back in uh, around the same time the comic started early 80s and so we're constantly talking about the la punk scene that we were both part of though we uh we experienced a lot separately but we knew the same bands, you know, what was going on. So we're always matching stories about uh, about the the past mm. like that. So Did you find out you were at the same shows? Oh, yeah. Okay, um, I assume that was, yeah. Yeah, and, 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 but she was hanging out in L.A. I was still in my small town, Oxnard. We had our little small town punk scene while she was hanging out in the big city, you know. Um, so we just match stories, you know, and stuff. And so I think about it a lot about the past. So I think about Maggie and Hopi's past and I start to, to create like, okay, when they were 15, they did it like this. When they were 16, it started to, they started to do this. And I started looking at the past of how, how I did the comic in the early days. Like, okay, they had an apartment together here. How old are they? Okay, they were about 17, 18, and this and that. And, you know, it just started to come together. And it's so I started to uh, just think think about those days and think about, well, and now we're old and we kind of laugh at ourselves because because we're too old to go to shows, you know? Yeah. The music's too loud. You're banging you know? your knee at the... the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so I, I thought, well, that's what the, the Maggie and Hopi uh, are going to go through. Like, mm-hmm. like they're, uh, they're these two old ladies, you know, who, yeah. like, are you going to go to that show? I don't know. Should we? You know, that, that kind And of... all the friends staring at their screens at the, the table. And, <laughs> and Yeah. Yeah. And... and and the the story expanded. At first, it was just going to be Maggie and Hopi were going to go and just hang out in the back of the show and then go home, and nothing was going to happen. Of course, it became it created a life of its own, and it became a whole different story. But uh, yeah, and you know, I I find, and I'm trying not to, but I'm finding that whenever I do those characters, they're always looking at the past. They're always like. Yeah. Thinking, thinking back about about what they were and stuff, and I and I didn't mean for it to be that way, but that's all. That's what I do, you know. I think about, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah. Remember when we were like that? Well, we're not like that anymore, you know. Isn't that funny? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, that'd be a good story to tell, you know. But I keep, I seem to be telling that a lot, like there, it's the search, searching for lost uh, innocence. Mm-hmm. kind of thing and 
I don't mean to. It's just where my mind goes because of the age I'm at. Yeah. You know, the only thing I keep out of telling my past is I keep my comics out of it. I keep my po comic world. Yeah, you don't um, do a recursive metafictional blah blah blah. And, and yeah, partly because in a in a small way, I was very successful at my in my comic world. My characters are not successful. Yeah. And telling telling them having success, once they have success, they disappear for five years till they have another problem to come back. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's just the way my head goes. Is punk rock dead? For some people. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do you still go to shows? For me, not? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not sitting here with a mohawk, you know. It's, it's... Yeah. No, no, I, I, you know, I don't do it anymore yeah. you know I, i'll listen to an old record once in a while but right uh, and and then my younger brother's still in bands mm -hmm. and i whenever he's playing close to where i live you know i'll go see him yeah and, but just out of familial yeah, bond yeah. as opposed to yeah the, and then seeing yeah. old friends you know yeah old punk friends and stuff like that which you know that all led to this reunion thing just one i just wanted to see for myself where these characters ended up mm -hmm. you know and uh because i i remember it was a weird pattern where uh went through the punk thing and as i started to fade fade out friends started to drop off and then i noticed 20 years later they started to come back mm -hmm. people like people were still alive <laughs> <laughs> you know and and i just noticed that oh they all come back and they're all kind of like like, hey, we're all getting together because remember our past? Remember when we used to do shows? Well, we're we're getting together and doing this. And it's the survivors, you know? Yeah. So the group is smaller, but they're still like this. They're still like, you know, kind of this understanding, this punk understanding thing, even if not everybody is so involved mm -hmm. in it. Uh, some people still are. Uh, and I just... So that was another reason the story came about. Like, like you don't see someone for 20 or 30 years and then you come back. They've lived a whole life, you know, since then. And so I was curious, you know, to see what my characters were up to 30 years later. Like, which, which ones are still alive? Which ones were successful? Which ones died? You know, and, uh, Something really bittersweet about it, you know. Do you see life post Maggie and Hopi? I mean, I know the comics have branched away from them sometimes, but... Right. Yeah. Um, there are times where I think Maggie's got nothing left to say, mm -hmm. you know, and then, but she's so ingrained in me that I can't let, let her go. You know, um, Maggie is she's not always supposed to have these long epic stories. She just writes them. You know, yeah. I can't stop her. You know, if, when I put her in something is, is brewing bigger and bigger and bigger with her. And I can't, I can't just put it in an eight page story and, and let her go home. Yeah. You know, there's something's got to happen. Something emotional, something, uh, something that cha changes her life. And it's just her character that does that. I can't leave it alone, you know. Yeah. It, so, so yeah, I I'd love to put them to bed, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> but they just Maggie just writes it all. She just, I put Maggie in. She writes the story. I yeah. don't have to do anything. Right. You know? It's weird. And you do branch out. You've got the the science fiction superhero side strip going on and yeah and, that's that's the uh autopilot stuff yeah you know that that i love to just go crazy on because you don't have to draw a real car yeah you yeah what's your most hated thing to draw you don't have to draw a real building yeah it, are cars the worst thing for you to draw oh yeah okay. okay and and being that southern california native every time i put my characters going somewhere they're in a fucking car yeah until my first trip to to san diego i didn't get it 
And then I was like, oh, okay, I, I totally get the car culture You're thing now. Now that I'm here, I, yeah. Yeah. And driving somewhere. Every LA show is always people, you know, sitting on cell phones in cars because that's how you travel in LA. You're not, you know, ever, you know, yeah. let me walk over to that guy's building. Yeah. yeah. So I always have to draw like, okay, the characters are, are, are in this room talking, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Next scene. Oh, I have to draw them in the car driving to the thing. I don't want to draw. <laughs> How do I keep cars out of this? I can never keep cars out of it. <laughs> you got to move crazy. Move your stuff to, to New York or something. I, I don't, don't know. like the technical stuff. Yeah. You know, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, other media, have you written or tried to write at all for film or animation or anything like that? No. Okay. No, I, uh, it just doesn't. Uh, That's why I wondered if there'd ever been not if Hollywood would have been interested in in having you write something, but whether you would have any interest. No, I've in never doing, been approached yeah? to do to do something else like that. No, um, to do my work, yeah, they mm -hmm. always want to yeah. turn my work into something, but but never like uh, you want to write us some Roseanne episodes, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's a weird storytelling question, but um, page counts, and I mean you're you're publishing serially within the Love and Rockets comic. That stuff is going to be collected in trade paperbacks, but structuring the stories so that you're ending an issue, or you know the stories within an issue with some tension, or not. I mean I I know as you said the Maggie stories kind of write themselves, but at the same time. How conscious do you have to be of, you know, limiting things or, or keeping installments kind of, you know, paced as they oh, need to for the uh, physical, like, uh, the, the comic itself? Sometimes, sometimes it's, um, a lot of times it's for my sanity. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, this recent Maggie Hopi reunion story, I realized was going on four years, but I was doing, you know, four to eight pages at a time. Right. You know, so it's collected. It won't be that long, but I, it was going on for a long time and I was going, I want to finish this because I do not writing a story that takes four years and it happens in two nights. Yeah. Drives me crazy. I go, do I have to have them draw wearing these same clothes again? <laughs> and I, I mean, it's that's that simple that that's yeah. really the problem. Like I don't want to have Maggie wearing this outfit anymore. I don't want to draw this anymore. How do I end this? How do I get this out of my life? But I, yeah. at the same time, I don't want to cheat anybody. I don't want to cheat myself or cheat the reader. So I just stuck it out till I go, okay, do I see an end coming? Do I see it? Okay, I can see it coming. And so I said, I told myself, okay, this next issue, the one I just finished before I, before I came here, uh, I go, that's end. This story ends. So the Maggie and Hopi reunion story is over four years later. Bam. I look forward to it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, a lot of things I do for my sanity. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I did have a, a pal who's a huge longtime fan who was being driven insane by when the comic was coming out annually and you were doing the God and Science thing and she's like, but i i just want maggie and hopi back that was her you uh, know and she keeps doing these penny century superhero things but again you have the the, the story dictates everything for you yeah last question um the feeling the first time you saw somebody with 11 rockets tattoo i thought i cheated him yeah i thought um i thought uh why'd you do that you know the that, that's not that's going to be on you for the rest that's, of your life and that's that's, that's yeah. on your skin that's that's uh that's uh that's sacred that's the, that's more sacred than the louvre or the sistine chapel hmm. i mean your body putting putting a piece of someone's art on your body that's you can't get any closer than that and so i feel really like self-conscious and like yeah. like you you really want to you know, like dedicate your life to that, to uh, one of my drawings scares shit out of me, you know? Yeah. So 
I mean, when it all comes down to it, it's because I'm just so honored. Like you would really do that, you know, like this is, this is your body. This ain't just a, like a little book you have in the, in that drawer, yeah. you know, this is something you carry around with you for the rest of your life. Because Katie's got a huge one on her back. That's I'm just. I have a huge one on my side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just what big... are your tattoo stories? Yeah, tell us about the. I see the one on your hand. That's uh, and the one on your okay. other hand. So this one, yeah. the cross, the Pachuco cross, uh, just an old L.A. gang kind of thing, which I wasn't. Uh, that's my next question. First, I wasn't in from L.A. <laughs> 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 Two, I wasn't in a gang, but uh, I remember. Uh, Drawing this with Sharpie back in punk days a lot, you know, going to shows and then I would always draw it. And then after a while it would wash off. But uh, I remember my friend, a friend of mine was, uh, uh, he was saying, yeah, I do those tattoos where you just dip at the ink and then you just kind of. Ballpoint thing. Yeah. That. And uh, I was going, okay, do me a cross. I just thought, hey, cool. You know. And I remember we sat in my car, and he had used my ink bottle that I use for my comics. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he wound up the, uh, the ne he had the needle, and then he wound up the thread around it really tightly, and he just started, started poking. And I thought, hey, I'm cool. Yeah. yeah. And then... Uh, I'll have this for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then uh, for uh, the second one... I just didn't have another one. Uh, my younger brother and my friend, they were going to a tattoo guy to get Black Widow spiders on their necks. And we went and to he did their, local their spiders. He did a really shitty job. They looked like aphids more than anything. <laughs> <laughs> and while I was sitting there, I was going, I always draw this in the background of my comic, you know, mm -hmm. just a cave yeah. man with the spear running. I always draw that, you know, in the background. So... So I was just thinking, like, hey, maybe I'll get another tattoo while they were getting there. Um, and I just wrote on a piece of paper, and I just, he goes, anything else? And I go, how about this? And he just goes, 25 bucks. Mm -hmm. And I go, okay. And But I remember going, you fucked up there. You <laughs> fucked up there, Black Widows. And I go... Here, let me draw off. <laughs> yeah. And he mind. was like, no, I got it. And yeah. I remember just watching him. He had the marker, you know, and he was just drawing, right, drawing it. And I was going, you better do it right. You better do it right. <laughs> and then so he did that. And then uh, I didn't have one for many years. Then about a year or two ago, I did one on my shoulder. It's uh, uh, my hometown, my uh, my barrio. Yeah. S-C-C-H, mm -hmm. uh, Scalonchicas, uh, with a Black Widow. Done right this yeah. time. <laughs> and uh, I did it because my wife was getting tattoo. And it was that thing of like, should I get? Yeah, see, I think you getting taken into tattoo parlors is a bad idea. Because you, you keep, you know, I guess yeah. I have to as long as I'm here. Although we can get you a Fantagraphics discount with Graham Chaffee in, in L.A. He, oh, he told me to come in for my freebie. Yeah. So he, I'm, I, when I think of one, I'm going in. Uh, same here. When I get out to L.A. next time, because I've got one that I'd rather have redone into something else. And he was like, I'll, I'll take care of you. Because I've seen their shop does good. good oh, his, the Instagram feed for their, yeah. uh, their it's, it's amazing. Some of the things. Yeah. Um, it's also scary. Some of the things people want to do to their entire backs, <laughs> like the Lisa Simpson Dark Knight of the Soul that took up an entire <laughs> woman's back. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> I'll let you get back to Mocha. Jaime Hernandez, thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. And that was Jaime Hernandez. You can find him on Twitter as Jaime H, which is X-A-I-M-E-H. His Love and Rockets comics are available through Fantagraphics, and his new book, The Dragon Slayer, Folk Tales from Latin America, is available from Toon Graphics, an imprint of Toon Books, and is in bookstores everywhere. It's not Love and Rockets, but those stories are delightful, and if I had kids, I would definitely get this for them. And thanks again to the publicity staff at Toon for getting this together so quickly. Also, Fantagraphics has recently published Jaime Hernandez Studio Edition, an oversized hardcover that reproduces about 200 pages of Jaime's original artwork, 
along with a dozen or so unpublished pages and an interview that I maybe should have read before sitting down with Jaime last weekend. Still, I think this one worked out great. Also, be sure to check out Katie Skelly's new book from Fantagraphics, My Pretty Vampire. You can find our old episode from 2014, 2015, and I hope a new one later this year. And once we wrapped up that main session, I asked Jaime, so, who have you been reading? If you want to hear his jokey answer to that, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memory Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. The newest episode of that one should be up next weekend, and it'll feature new segments from Dave McKean, Paul Karasik, Mark Newgarden, Seymour Quast, John Leland, Ann Hulbert, Henry Wessels, Lauren Weinstein, Jerry Beck, Willard Spiegelman, Levi Tadar, and Jesse Scheidlauer. You can support the Virtual Memories Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. There are all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, my new secret project that I'm still not getting back to because i got all sorts of other stuff going on, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, this one cost me 18 bucks for the ferry to and from New York, uh, another 12 bucks, I think, for parking, plus coffee, lunch, etc. But I also got in that live podcast with Roz Chass during Mocha, so, yeah, so that was half the cost for the episode, I guess. Still, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the Virtual Memories show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, coffee, or just toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to John Wendler, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Stephen Nadler, Wallace Wilde Minozzi, Noah Van Skyver, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Garrett Zecker, Craig P. Steffen, Jack Lescamella, Joe Caruso, Paul Karasik, and Michael Janizek for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories show. We have the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Now, our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with, I hope, Ilana Meyer, author of the new fantasy novel Fire Dance. We haven't recorded yet, but on the plus side, as I mentioned at the top, I have a few episodes in my backlog, so there'll definitely be something next week. Still, I'm hoping it's Ilana. Till then, you can subscribe to the Virtual Memories show and download past episodes at the iTunes store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. That'll help build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. <laughs> <laughs>